July 25th, 2009 is tattooed on my left shoulder because that's the day I stepped out onto the stage in front of a thousand people at Chicago's iconic Metro Concert Hall and lived my childhood dream. And it was a dream literally since childhood. I can remember even at four years old being hypnotized by those beautiful three-part harmonies from that famous trio from the 60s and 70s, Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. <laughs> I hit my music adolescence around six. That's when I stopped caring about music made by chipmunks. <laughs> it was the early 80s, and if we were in the car on a Sunday between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., we'd better be listening to Casey Kasem's Top 40, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Unless you want to hear your child sing about how Billy Jean is not his lover without any musical accompaniment. <laughs> they never wanted to hear that. <laughs> the 80s were a very formative year for me, for uh, my music appreciation. Lionel Richie, Huey Lewis, DeBarge. <laughs> but it wasn't until I discovered MTV that things really changed for me. It's 1984, and I'm watching Prince, and he's looking back at me saying, let's go crazy. I'm watching Eddie Van Halen shred guitar, walking across desktops in a classroom in the video for Hot for Teacher. Videos are rock stars with beautiful girls. The tight clothes, the hair, the makeup. And that was just the guys. <laughs> this was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And right there in that moment, I know what I want to do with my life. I want to rock. I want to be up on stage. I want to hear fans screaming my band's name. And I joined my first band at 10 years old in 1986. Jonathan was on the tennis racket. <laughs> I was on the pots and pans. <laughs> Anthony was on the hairbrush. And that was the entire band. Because even in a world of make-believe instruments, nobody wanted to play the bass. That means no disrespect to bass players, but it's just a fact of life <laughs> that most people can't pick the bass line out of a rock and roll song, and they don't know who the bass player is of their favorite bands. It's always David Lee Roth, Eddie Van Halen, Alex Van Halen, and the other guy. <laughs> and that's why, at 14 years old, and now it's time for me to pick my first real instrument. The aspiring rock star in me really, really wants an electric guitar. But the future accountant in me <laughs> thought about this a little more practically. I mean, if everybody wanted to play guitar or sing or bang on the drums, then what would be my surest path to finding a band and eventually getting on stage and hearing fans chant my band's name. The supply and demand economics were very clear on this. <laughs> my first bass was a Gibson Epiphone. <laughs> Maybe amongst 14-year-old boys, the bass isn't the coolest instrument, but I got to say, when I held that sleek black Gibson Epiphone with the Stratocaster body in my hands, <laughs> I grew a few chest hairs that day. <laughs> the first song I learned to play, Hell's Bells by ACDC. As my musical tastes grow heavier, my mullet grows longer. <laughs> I joined my first band in the mid-90s, a heavy metal band out of Aurora, Illinois. It could not be more Wayne's World. Our first concert is literally filmed on cable access TV. We are so metal, 
we start a Metallica tribute band as a side project. <laughs> we play in and around Chicago and the suburbs, but one gig always eluded us. The holy grail of gigs, the Chicago Metro. The Chicago Metro is an 1,100 capacity venue that any rock band that you've heard of out of Chicago has played at. And also, probably lots of bands you've never heard of. The Metro didn't make you famous, but it was one of those milestones that as, as a band that if you reached that, it really meant that you did something awesome. But now it's the early 2000s, and I'm in a heavy metal band in an alternative rock world. It was hard enough to get 10 people to come to our shows, let alone 1,000. And now I'm in my mid-20s, and the real world is calling, texting me even, <laughs> telling me that it's time to get a real job with a real paycheck. So I quit the band. I get back into school. I get a degree. I get a job. I get married. I get a house in the suburbs. The Gibson Epiphone becomes a collection of memories and dust, replaced by a fallback plan that's based in an aptitude for numbers and a proficiency in Microsoft Excel. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about the performing arts, I find, is that you could stop the performing but the art never leaves. It stays with you. It hibernates somewhere in your heart, in your soul, just waiting. And the difference between the performing arts and a day job is that you can leave and come back. Because it's like uh, Bob Seger always says, right? Rock and roll never forgets. And I get the itch one day, and I find myself now in 2007 at an open mic night at a bar called Murphy's Bleachers across the street from Wrigley Field. And I meet this singer-songwriter who's just phenomenal. Amazing musician, blows my mind. And it turns out he's forming a band. And would you know it, they didn't have a bass player. <laughs> the supply and demand economics are working in my favor again. <laughs> and he asks me if I want to join his chiptune rock band. And if you don't know what that means, it basically means a video game themed band. And if you don't know what that means, <laughs> means we use a program called Little Sound DJ to write original compositions that emulate the sounds of vintage arcade games. And if you don't know what that means, <laughs> it means we're huge nerds. We're on the cusp of an underground music scene. And I got to say, I'm very ready to be the other guy. <laughs> and now it's July 5th, July 25th, 2009. And we're backstage at the Metro. I'm nervous. I'm very excited, but I'm scared. I'm numb. I'm all these things all at once because, you know, we can wish for something. And we're always prepared for it not to happen. But we're hardly ever fully prepared when it does happen. And I start thinking, you know, what if I forget my lines? You know, what if I break a string? What if I slip and fall? And then I think about how hard we work to get here. And my, how long my own personal journey has been. It's been 20 years since I picked up that Gibson Epiphone. And in this moment, I realize that anything else that happens after today is just extra. And as we're ready to hit the stage, I hear a thousand people in the audience chanting my band's name. And I step out onto the stage, and I live my childhood dream. Thank you very much.